The condition is really crazy condition. And I shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Mateo Yakino giving up to an elbow around for his body. Here we go. Woo! What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team is just going to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 15, and this week we literally have the king of windsurfing. Uh, he talks about wooden booms, he talks about windows in sails, swept back daggerboards, and the massive invention that was the footstrap, and how it all happened in Kalua, uh, where he lived. Um, we talk about uh, riders, team riders, because obviously he went on to form his own brand, and how he didn't want to give them custom boards. Uh, we talk about Burnt Rodiger, uh, and how he says his head was up his ass. <laughs> yes, we talk about investments, uh, and we talk about how he is not actually a very good businessman. There is lots in this podcast. It's been much anticipated and probably the most requested. It is, of course, the one and only king of windsurfing, Robbie Nash. The king is in the house. He's actually in his own house in Maui, and we're doing this through Zoom for obvious reasons. But um, thank you, thank you, Robbie, for for finding the time for a little little chat. <laughs> My pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah. Can Sorry, I, can it took a while to coordinate. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Can I can I address you, Your Highness, for the length of this podcast? Yeah, just call me Robbie. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously you're in Maui and this is a little bit of a special year. Um, I guess normally summer or a lot of the year would be your travel time. How, how is it to, to just be stuck there? I mean, it, it is paradise, but I think for the last, what, 45 years, you've been on the road pretty much. How's that? Yeah, you know, these have been really interesting times. I, I told people this is the longest I've been home in one stretch since I graduated from high school. Um, and it's, it, all things considered, I think Maui is probably the best place in the world to be stuck. Uh, you know, we have almost no COVID. We've been pretty much free the entire time, even through the worst times we could go to the beach every day, you know, so I've been riding a ton. Uh, it's just a little strange not to be getting on an airplane after uh, so many years of traveling pretty much nonstop. And, you know, even in the winter, I'm, I'm constantly coming and going, coming and going somewhere. So it's been different. You know, it's, it's been, uh, I guess, different for everybody, though. So yeah. that's how it is. Does it mean a lot more a lot more water time if you're there, or a little, or just a lot more office time? Well, it's it's certainly more water time because when I travel, you tend to not get in the water that much. You know, even if you're traveling, like in the old days, traveling to World Cups, for example, you know, you'd go somewhere, you'd spend ten days there, sometimes two weeks, but if you count the amount of time that you really spent on the water. Even if you won, like if you won every heat you did, you don't actually spend that much time in the water. You spend a lot of time driving and getting to the beach and rigging, and you go out for a 15 or 20 minute warm up, and then you got to come off the water. You wait for your heat, you do your 12 minutes, and then you wait six hours to your next 12 minutes if you win. And so the, the time now is. I would say way more time on the water than usual because I'm getting in the water basically every day. Like uh, yesterday I took a day off just because I was so sore. You know, we ended up just saying, oh, fuck it, let's do yard work or something instead because um, pretty much every day I've been getting on the water. So it's it's been really good for development, for testing, for just, you know, riding and staying in shape because it's been constant. And fortunately, we've had really good conditions. Huh? We had a, it's been crazy windy. windy yeah, next windy, year, windy. you might get, you might get a lot more 
windsurf tourists to Maui because everybody's like, ah, Maui's flat in the summer. And then you have all you guys just posting stuff every, like every day there's, you know, shoulder high or waist high waves and it's just super windy and looks really fun. Yeah, it's been crazy windy. And, and honestly, we've had pretty good swell. We didn't have a lot of south swell this summer. We had an early, you know, really good south swell. The beginning it was really spring, but no real good south swell all summer. And then um, we've had quite a bit of north swell, wind bump, just enough to get out. Really good for, for wing surfing. It hasn't been that great for wind surfing like wave sailing, but it's been really good for slalom and just blasting around. Yeah. So you say you're still on the water pretty much every day at 56 sorry to to bring that 57 <laughs> 57 yeah 57 57 there I, you go i was born in april 1963 so um getting old yeah but still every day on the water and you've touched on that and i actually really want to know personally as well you've touched on that um in like I've seen the teaser of your new movie that came out last year and you said like I've been searching for a goal kind of and I, I wonder like you go out on the water every single day and how many of those sessions are kind of for yourself for fun obviously you're always sort of having fun one way or the other but you like I know from experience I've been doing this maybe six years you've been doing 46 <laughs> and and you know like you rarely or i rarely go to the water without a specific goal whether it be the gear testing preparing for a contest whatever certain thing you're you're doing so so do you ever just just go out sailing or kiting or supping or winging or whatever I I actually go way more often probably than I should just for fun. I think that's probably the only reason I'm still doing it and still so passionate about it. If if it was work or I had something, you know, that I had to accomplish or test every time I went out, I probably would have stopped doing it. Or I'd be doing it a lot less and I'd be working a lot more. Um, you know, but it's I funny think... it's funny you say that because a lot of like of course everybody has that passion and like i think all the best windsurfers they they love to go windsurf or surfers whatever you know but i think if anything for a lot of the guys it brings more passion if you have that goal to go you know because you yeah. just I mean, it never gets boring, right? It's not like you're just taking your same old board and your same old sail. It's it's constantly evolving and changing, and and there is always something that has to be tested or developed. But I don't really look at it that way because then it it starts to feel like work, and to me, it's never been work. Uh, work is sitting behind a computer. Work is stressing about numbers, dealing with employees, you know, the business side of of the sport. So when I'm on the water, like even if I am testing things and going in and out, like the other day I was testing wings and, and different fuselages foiling on the wing surfer. It was, um, it still didn't feel like work. You know, I was, I really enjoy that aspect of it. I'm not a tinkery guy. You're not going to see me looking at my GPS and coming in and out. And like when I go right, even if I'm testing, it's very organic. Um, it's all about feel. Yeah, I think I'm going faster. You know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, super scientific about it. I'm playing, you know, I, I have fun on the water, whether it's paddling around on a sup or winging or windsurfing or kiting or, you know, testing boards that I've, I've made. It's, um, it's still fun. And that's the core of it. And even the, that kind of work is fun. I don't really look at that as, as work. And uh, in that respect, I think, you know, we're really lucky to, to do what we do for, for a living. That's why I've been doing it so long and trying to keep it going. I realize how lucky I am to get paid to do this. So yeah. I'd be doing it anyway. 
true. Yeah. How many, how many of the guys that you, you know, competed against um, in your 20s or even grew up windsurfing or whatever are still there around and you see, still see them enjoying it as much as you do, you know, even if they're not professionally involved? You know, there's, there's quite a few that are still around. Um, not a lot of them are windsurfing. Some are, uh, but they kite. A lot of them have gotten into wing, wing, wing foiling here lately. A lot of the, the older guys, that's kind of brought this whole resurgence of, of getting old guys back on the water. Uh, but quite a few, you know, there's Alex Aguera, for example, you know, I've, I've known him since the windsurfer days and he's still out there almost every day now winging, foiling, testing stuff. Uh, but I still run into some of the older guys. Matt Schweitzer still gets out there and windsurfs um, a lot. And, and some of the guys from that era, which is really cool. Ken Winter, you know, who was a windsurfer. Shit, he was at the first windsurfer North American Championships that I went to in 1976 in Berkeley, California. And he still gets out there. He's not windsurfing, but he's, you know, kiting and developing stuff and windsurfing. And this isn't the kind of sport that people disappear from. I think if they have the means and their body allows them, at one level or another, they keep doing it for a really long time. So it's, you don't see a lot of retired windsurfers. You see people that, you know, haven't done it for a long time, but in their heart, you know, they, they wish they were still. And if they have the ability, they're still getting out there, even if it's on their old gear. Yeah, I think the ones that, that go away, they, they come back even kind of stronger. You know, you, you move to, to a city and start an office yeah. job and make all the money and you're still like, ah, shit, something's missing, you know, so... Yeah, I meet a lot of people traveling around the world that, you know, the, the 70s and 80s were the best time of their life. Windsurfing was like their, you know, their free time. And then they grew up, they got a job, they had a family, they did all that for 15, 20, 30 years. And now a lot of them are rediscovering yeah. windsurfing or, or winging or kiting or whatever it is that's bringing them back to the water. But they always say, oh, those are the best times of my life. And I, I get it. Yeah. You mentioned the, the Berkeley Worlds um, 1976, correct? Yeah. And you yeah, said they were. they were the first ones you went. I didn't know they were the first ones you went, but they are the first ones you won, right? At 13 years old. Is that, you know, it's pre-internet. So all these informations are a little bit. Right. That was way pre-internet. Yeah. yeah. Um. I want to know, did you expect to even do good? Did you like, you, you windsurfed for what, a couple of years and like, it's so, you know, now where like, I talked to some of the younger guys and I'm like, shit, it took me like five years to learn to forward. And the guy would ask, couldn't you go on YouTube? You know, I'm like, right. no, you know, no. So in these days it was even like, you didn't know who was good. You couldn't ask around and. And whatever you were in Oahu, the event the event was in California. Like, did you did you have any expectation? What do you even remember from from that that time? Well, the the way I got there, we had um in the summer of 1976, we had the Hawaii Regional Windsurfer Championships, and what people need to know as well is back then there was only one windsurfer. It was the windsurfer. There was one brand, one sail size, one boom made out of wood, one board, one dagger board. That was it. There was no, no second brand. There was no Mistral. There was no wind glider. It was just the windsurfer. So it was a one design. And, uh, you know, it was just course racing, triangle racing, like, uh, like sailboat racing. So we had the Hawaii Regional Championships in that summer. And if... You had more than 50 entries into your event. Windsurfer International would give a, a ticket to the, the winner to the North American Championships. We didn't have 50 windsurfers in Hawaii at the time. So we entered like dogs and girlfriends and whatever to get enough entries to, to uh, have a ticket. I ended up winning that event. And so that's what got me the, the airfare to Berkeley, California. And went to Berkeley, had no idea, you know, if I was good, bad, 
you know, I was, I was small. I knew that, you know, I was the smallest guy there by far. And I was pretty fast, especially in light wind. You know, I weighed, I think, less than 100 pounds at the time. But I was still pretty good. I could go when the wind was strong, too. But in light wind, I had a real advantage. And the winds that uh, that event were pretty light. I ended up getting um, getting second. I didn't win. But Mike Waltz won. And he already had a free airfare to the Worlds from the Worlds the year before or something. So I got his airfare to the Worlds. And that's what got me to the World Championships in the Bahamas was that free airfare. I, I, we weren't, you know, I didn't come from a wealthy family. Um, when I went to the Bahamas you know, a couple months later to the World Championships in 76, um, I was 13 years old. I went by myself. Another, neither of my parents went. I slept on the floor of the windsurfer staff photographer. He, he's a guy, a photographer named Steve Wilkings, who was from Honolulu took a lot of the really early windsurfing photos. Like if you see the, the really early Hawaiian windsurfing shots, they were all Steve Wilkins photos. So he went, he kind of chaperoned me to make sure that I got there. I slept on the floor of his hotel room, um, went to that event. There were 400 and something competitors. I was the only kid there. It's all these giant European guys wearing speedos and stuff. I was like, Oh my God. And it was, uh, it was culture shock. It was amazing. I had no idea again, if I was good or bad or how it would end up. And, uh, again, fortunately the conditions were, were pretty favorable for me. It was pretty light wind. Uh, I ended up winning and the rest is history. I, I won another airfare at winning in the Bahamas. It gave me a free airfare to Sardinia, Italy in 1977. I won there, which gave me a, free airfare to Cancun, Mexico in 78. I won there, which gave me a free airfare to, to Greece and Florida in 79. We had two world championships in 1979 because it was the year of that whole Cold War, Russia, U.S. thing. And so Olympics, they were separated. So we had two world championships, one including the Russians and those guys and one without. So I, I was third, I think, in Greece and first in Florida. And then kind of continued from there until the port, the sport turned pro in 1981, which was the year I, I graduated from high school. So really good timing there. Yeah. So before you, before you graduated, it was just basically like you would just go off to these events and then come back and be a normal kid and go windsurfing after school. Was that it? No income yeah, from windsurfing? No... No, no, you back, back then it was strictly amateur. Uh, windsurfing went Olympic in 1984. And at that point, if you took one dollar for anything, you were no longer an amateur and couldn't compete in the Olympics. So actually, in 1981, the first two professional events that we had uh that i won the maui speed crossing and the uh what was the other one uh, the maui grand prix were the first two big events i donated the the prize money half to my school half to the u.s olympic committee so i could retain my amateur status because at that point i wasn't sure if it was you know if i was going to go to the olympics or try to go to the olympics or turn pro because the sport was just kind of evolving into a the potential to maybe earn some money then. And what I did is I was going to go to university in California. I was accepted to UC Santa Cruz. And uh, I could see that maybe something was going to happen with pro windsurfing. So I deferred admissions, said, well, I'm going to take a year off before I go to university and see what this becomes, you know, see what, what is a professional windsurfer. And uh, never went back. I'm still you know, still waiting to go to college. So it was <laughs> never it was too late. Lucky. And at that point, again, it was amateur. There weren't that many events. So I wasn't missing a lot of school. Uh, I didn't actually windsurf that much. School was really important to me. I got really good grades through high school. So I was only missing, you know, for maybe two events a year. And even during the week, I usually didn't windsurf after school, just on weekends. 
because uh, yeah, I was lucky actually because now my high school education is all I have, and uh, you know I'm, I'm glad that I paid attention and did well because I'm I'm using it every day and in, in what I do in business and whatnot, and so yeah. I'm lucky in that respect. Again, like pre pre internet times, pre emails, pre pre cell phone, pre cell phone, you were. I don't know if fax was even around telegrams maybe I don't know what you guys like you say like I thought that there might be something going on with the sport becoming pro and and whatever how like how do you even hear those things how do you even get well, these we kind were, of we were kind of at the center of it yeah everything was phone back then there was no fax yet there was Teletex. We had a Telex machine in the in the living room because at that point my dad stopped teaching high school and had already began doing design work for Mistral. And that that he started in 1980. So we had a Telex machine in, in the office, which was like, tick, 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 like something out of an old war movie. Um but the whole vibe was coming from from Hawaii. So anything that was going on in windsurfing, this was the focal point. Kailua was the epicenter for development. We had the Pan Am World Cup. So the very first custom boards, the very first European guys that worked for different brands that were coming into the sport, they all found their way to Kailua. And the magazine, Surf Magazine, Wind Magazine France, uh, High Wind Magazine Japan, you know, they were all doing their feature stuff here. Um, not, not necessarily Maui yet at that time. Oh, it was yeah. still more Oahu. But uh, so it became, you know, pretty easy for me because I was to a degree the, the, the guy everybody was looking at at that point because by then I had been world champion many times. I lived in the Mecca for the development of the sport surrounded by – you know, a lot of the best guys in the sport. So again, I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I didn't need to be like, you know, if I lived in Hawaii and, and windsurfing was taking off in France, I wouldn't be here right now. Even if it was California and I was in Hawaii, I wouldn't be here right now. I just luckily happened to be right exactly where the sport was booming. And so people were, were coming to me. It's not like I was searching sponsorship. They were coming and saying, hey, we want you to ride our stuff or hey, we want you to use our wetsuits. Hey, we want you to use our whatever it is. So very much luck of being in the right place at the right time. Yeah. So the sport turns pro and there's a bunch of contests popping up and you decide to go pro, which probably wasn't easy because you have the Olympics kind of yeah it was a big decision yeah potential um okay so let's talk about that decision a little bit like what what, what came into that like there you, you're you're basically deciding to become a pro in a sport that doesn't really have a foundation yet let's say yeah you know? there, were, there were no pros in any of these sports at that point there, there were no pro surfers there were no pro skateboarders snowboarding didn't even exist yet uh it was um uncharted territory and so there was no path and that's why it was okay i'm gonna cross my fingers take a year before i go to university and, and see what happens see where it goes but there was so much momentum and energy at that point you know, already in 1981, for example, uh, we had the Japan Cup and pretty much everybody went. It was on Niijima Island in Japan. It was a one design event on a really horrible board called the Morpho Surfer. It was like, it wasn't Division 2 yet. It was like, like, Division one, if you remember those days, it was like a semi round bottom board, just horrible. It was slow on every point of sale. It was unstable. It was heavy. It was horrible. But everybody went because they offered um, incredible prize money. I think at that point it was uh, $50,000 total prize money, $10,000 cash first prize, which in 1981 was quite a bit of money. 
even by today's standards in our sports, man, you know, first prize barely Congrats. gets that. You know, it's not like windsurfing in the 80s where we were getting $250,000 in prize money. So, you know, I went off to that, went home with $10,000 in cash in an envelope. That made me think, damn, this is really turning into something. You know, that was almost as much as my dad made in a year teaching the last year. He, he yeah, that's taught. like 50 grand now, isn't it? Or, or maybe more. Yeah, so it, it pretty quickly became really quite substantial. You know, it, it took off from there and that was you know, several years before the world tour was formed, 1981, 1982, into the early 1983, there were just pro events all over the world. We had the Rip Pro Quicksilver Classic in Australia. We had the Japan Cup. We had the Sony Surflight in Australia. We had the Hang 10 World Cup in California. We had the O'Neill events. There was a lot of money and a lot of, you know, just growth in the sport. We were inventing equipment and disciplines and it wasn't until uh 83 that the wsma was formed the world sailboard manufacturers association and a real world tour was formed with a professional world title before that it was just pro events around the world that you'd go to and win but there was no ranking and uh when the wsma was formed that is really the beginning of the PWA. The WSMA turned into the WBA, which turned into the PBA, which turned into, yeah, today's today's Pro Tour. Yeah. So you mentioned the equipment by 81, basically by the early 80s, it was already like taking off and changing at a pace that I think it's kind of hard to imagine even today. Like, what was it like? You were just there in Oahu and your buddy down the road, decided i don't know to chop off three feet of the nose or the put tail. a window in his sail or yeah. whatever you know like yeah it was uh pat love who was a local guy he started putting the windows in the sails and then my dad started sewing windows in the sails you know we went from having that little tiny square window to these giant windows so we could actually see where we were going uh, the storm dagger board because windsurfers just had a big dagger board. We did the sweat back dagger board. That was Larry Stanley, Mike Horgan, Ken Clyde, Dennis Davidson. There was this little crew of guys that were, you know, rapidly developing the windsurfer. Foot you know, straps. Putting the, the front of a board in a black trash stick bat, plastic bag, putting it in the sun, heating up the board so you could bend more nose rocker into the board. We called it the super scoop. Because the windsurfer was really flat rockered. And if you rode waves with it, it always purled. So you'd heat up the nose of the board, bend it way up, make a super scoop, and then you could go ride waves out at Flat Island. Things like that, you know, where it, we took the existing gear. And then my dad started making custom boards in the garage, going, well, this, there has to be a better way than these big plastic boards. So I started making custom boards. You know, started out 12 feet long and then slowly started getting shorter eventually getting rid of the dagger board and just having three fins in the tail. Um, foot straps came in 1978. Before that, we had boogie bumps. So the boards, especially custom boards, were pretty slippery. The windsurfer was really slippery, but you would take a rasp and, and make big gouges in the plastic to stick your feet into. Okay, so no wax yet. No wax. And custom boards, you couldn't take a rasp and make big grooves in your board, so you waxed it. Wax is still pretty slippery. Uh, and so we glued down boogie board foam, called them boogie bumps. So you had strips of boogie board foam to kind of push your toes against before foot straps. And then uh, in 1978, uh, put the first foot straps on board, and that changed everything. In the beginning, I, I only used back straps. I didn't use front straps. <laughs> and then uh, eventually put front and back straps. So you realized back then that if you do one footers, it will be the front foot that goes out. <laughs> exactly. You already knew. Yeah. So then, the, so then you, you can go from just because it was just racing at the beginning, right? And then you can go from you have foot straps, you can jump and you can ride waves. And, and was that just straight away more appealing to you you know being in hawaii no, I, 
it was appealing from the very first day. I mean, that, that's the thing, just that, that plain old windsurfer with a wooden boom and a triangle sail and a big heavy board. Even when that's all there was, that was just as much fun as what we have today. I mean, it was, it was so cool and it just got cooler and cooler and it got more and more fun, but it, it's not like I was waiting for something else, right? It just kept happening. Like the wind server was the best thing ever. It was a surfboard with a sail on it. Like it was the best of, of everything. And then it got even better with custom and it got even better with shorter boards and it got even better with faster sails. So the stoke kept coming, but it's not like it wasn't fun before that stuff. It was already so much fun. Like, no, I'm just getting at the fact that, you know, later on you, you kind of really went into wave sailing. Of course you yeah. kept racing. You always raced, but wave sailing was really your, your thing, yeah. wasn't it? And, and it's funny well, you, you say that, that it was the coolest thing ever. And like funny how now you look at the gear and it's so freaking cool yet the general public doesn't really see windsurfing as that cool doesn't it and then you look at all these photos from back in the day and you're like you know yeah. and, and then it was like the coolest thing ever you know like right so that's yeah. that's Time's pretty changed. crazy i mean it is yeah i say it with a heavy heart let's say but <laughs> <laughs> but it is what it is yeah so I, then, I, don't, I, I just say that the sport's got more exclusive again yeah more that's small. a good way that's more that's exclusive. a good way to put it for sure yeah and in a way they have because they've gotten somewhat hard, like all the evolution like you've made, for example, in, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, it, it's hard for a guy to just learn it in two weeks, what took you guys 30 years. So it is a little bit of that, but there is also the element of, you know, all the other sports and just a lot of cool shit in the world around that just spreads that tension yeah, i guess a lot more choices to go have fun now yeah yeah coming back to to your story you you get on tour you get on the professional tour and then the disciplines pop up and you know you start having short boards for slalom and some wave sailing or some freestyle and you win you win you win you win you win and then some guys, I guess, a little younger than you, 10 years younger and whatever, Anders, actually Anders is not 10 years younger than you, but, you know, Anders, Robbie, I don't know, Phil in course racing, all these guys, they, they come and it starts to get... Well, Phil is older than me. Yeah, but he came, he <laughs> came a lot, he came a lot, um, a lot later. Yeah. Like yeah, he, exactly. it was funny because first, first I interviewed Anders and he said like, the sport was super fun. We were having tons of fun until Phil came with his fucking little notebook and started writing all the, all the, right. all the data down. And then yeah. I interviewed Phil. I gave him that quote. And he says, no, no, it was Robbie. Robbie was so serious and so, so no. on it with the gear and with not partying and with this and that. I'm like... Well, that's true, but I wasn't writing anything down. I was, it was all feel for me. But yeah, I wasn't partying. It was serious, no doubt. But... Yeah no notebooks or anything it was just practice 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 yeah yeah and that i mean just paint us a picture of these days because also anders told me like we were at dinner with bjorn and robbie and robbie told me like robbie told us don't worry boys it's on me i made my money before you guys came in <laughs> so describe us a little bit those early 80s all that boom for windsurfing just globally and 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 how it how it felt to be in the in the middle of that whole whirlwind they, i guess i don't know <laughs> they were pretty amazing times um for me i always had a real sense of appreciation for how lucky i was to be doing this and so i took it pretty seriously um like Andre said, you know, I wasn't the party guy. I didn't do anything that would compromise my ability to be able to do my job. And although I loved it and I had so much fun doing it, I, I didn't want to mess it up 
by, you know, like you wouldn't see me on a dirt bike. You wouldn't see me, you know, doing errors in a half pipe on a skateboard. You, I, I wouldn't do things that could potentially uh, risk injury, for example, because um, I knew you miss one event, you're done for the year, you're ranking. Um, it was also because there was no real path forward that you didn't know if it was going to last six months or a year and be done. And that was fun. Now I got to do something else. I always had that fear that there wasn't a long-term future in it. You know, it was, it was, there was a hope. There was a, I'm going to do as good as I can. I want to be the best representative for my sponsors that I can be. I want to win as much as I can because that's going to help maybe being able to do this next year as well, if it lasts. And there was a certain fear of losing as well. It wasn't that I loved winning. I didn't love beating other guys. I really hated losing. And I wanted to do whatever it would take to be able to keep doing it. Um, this is all I do. It's still all I do. I don't know how to do anything else. I always said, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be working at McDonald's. Um, so I took it real seriously. I trained real hard. I, you know, I wasn't the guy that was constantly developing equipment. I take my equipment that I had and learn to ride it as good as I could. And then when, when I got better equipment, okay, I would reluctantly start to work on that to ride it as good as I could. You know, I wasn't one of those guys that had gear that was better than my ability. It was my ability was probably sometimes better than my gear. Like I was the last guy to go to vertical fins. I was the last guy to use cambers. I used my camber sails. I took the cambers out because I, I didn't like the feel. To me, it's always about feel. And, you know, the more time on the water to get used to your gear so you just you could ride it with your eyes closed. Where other guys, they'd come to the beach with 10 boards, like Bjorn and Anders in those days of racing. Literally, they'd have a caddy and they'd have eight or 10 boards on the beach. And it was this constant, which board am I going to use in and out and in and out? And that's what launched the, you know, the incredible development of the sport. But it wasn't coming from me. I had my one slalom board and I was like, I was going to ride that board no matter what. And it worked for a long time until it didn't. You know, like for me, the switch from raked fins, which was pure style and technique, to vertical fins, which was pure boat speed and equipment. Like you could win on equipment that wasn't all that fast in the days of beach starts and swept back fins. Once it went to water start, figure eight, vertical fins, weight jackets, if your gear wasn't fast, you had no chance. And eventually, even if your gear was fast, but you didn't weigh 90 kilos, you had no chance because, you know, I would wear a weight jacket with 10 kilos, but Bjorn was also wearing a weight jacket with 12 kilos or, you know, whatever it was, it just became this crazy arms race in equipment that I wasn't that good at that. Once the yeah. sport went in that direction, I held on for a while, but when it, when it went from feel to technology and, and gear, uh, I got a little bit lost in the shuffle and I went from winning everything to getting sevenths. And, you know, eventually when I started getting 11ths and 13ths, uh, that's when I stopped racing, but it took a long time. Fortunately, you know, it was a very gradual transition yeah. until yeah. it became. Super yeah, definitely. Tough. You mentioned like you, you know, you were kind of, you didn't like losing and then you would do everything it took to, to win and whatever. But I mean, by the late eighties, you're like 20 plus times world champion and it's it's got to be hard to reinvent yourself every year like every year i'm gonna go to that same place whatever start in japan finish in silt go to that same place do that same thing okay beach starts are fun you know making money is definitely fun and whatever but like how do you re-up every year you know re-up the motivation re-up the the fight it was probably getting harder which makes it maybe easier to motivate yourself right but yeah i never had a hard time motivating myself for me it was never it was never work um 
even when it became really difficult, like in racing to be, to be in the top five, it was still fun. Um, because it, again, it, it was constantly evolving. It's not like we were racing the same board around the same course. We were going to the same spots year after year after year, but there became something for me kind of nostalgic and cool in that as well. You know, n n watching people grow up, you know, uh, getting to know the owners of restaurants that you've been going to for 10 years or 15 years or, or 20 years. And I wasn't the kind of guy that would go to an event and look around and be a tourist. Like I went to the spot, I drove there, I rigged up my gear and I stayed there the entire time. I never came early and looked around the country. I never stayed longer and looked around and played tourists. Like I went to Almanar. That's all I saw. Almanar. When I went to Silt, I stayed in Westerland. Like that's yeah. it. Did you not did you not regret after a while? Like once you're where you were you wrapped it up, did you not regret like fuck, I've traveled all this thing and all I saw was the beach and the waves, you know? Like you know, because I was absolutely not interested. I was just focused on that. I wasn't going to go ride somewhere else that was maybe better conditions. I rode where the contest was going to be. But the cool thing was, as I slowly transitioned out of competing for a living, I got to enjoy all of that. I could go to a place and say, wow, I've been here 20 times. I've never seen this. This is super cool. Um, and it, Because when I stopped competing it's not like i retired from being a professional athlete it actually just went to a whole new level and that's where i could start to enjoy the sport differently i could ride different gear i could go to different places i could you know spend a little time smelling the flowers going and riding that spot down there instead of the competition area and so it kind of opened up yeah and you definitely you know you ride. definitely earned that but i would just be scared like Maybe it won't happen, you know, and then you go to Japan and what are you going to tell your grandkids? Like I had this thing. I had this exact thing in, in, in Korea out of all the places. I mean, you're lucky right. you didn't go there um, not to maybe downplay or offend anybody. But yeah, Jinha Beach is not very doesn't get you very, very inspired. Um, right. And then you're like, you know, the boys are going on a night out to Seoul, you know, and I'm like, no, no, you know, it's like, whatever. I don't want to whatever. And then you're like, the fuck am I going to tell my grandkids, you know, that I went to Korea and all I saw was Jinha beach, you know, and I didn't even have kimchi or anything, you know? So <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah, I never looked at it that way. Yeah. We, I mean, you got enough culture, you saw things, um, if that's all there was and I never got to go back, at least I got to go there and I, I, I gave it a hundred percent and did really well. You know, I, I had something to show for it that, um, at the end of the day, yeah, I didn't really feel like I was missing anything. I felt like I was gaining as a result of my focus. So yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Definitely. And everybody's, everybody's different. You know, there's, there's guys that were on tour, to, to seize the opportunity to smell the roses, to party, to, they weren't there to win and they were never going to win, but that's okay because it's not what they were there for. They were there for the experience and it was cool. I had a lot of those friends, you know, I, I appreciated it. Um, the fact that everybody's different and everyone approached competition and that whole windsurfing um, lifestyle differently. You know, you had yeah. the party animals that would show up at the beach straight from the disco in the morning and go out into their heat. And you're just like, oh, my God, how is he doing that? Uh, but that wasn't me. No, no, I'm not saying about the partying or whatever. But you, you mentioned right. that you never saw anything else and, and whatever, yeah. you know. But yeah, dedication, I guess. Dedication. Um, speaking of dedication, definitely a dedication when I think of you, I think of dedication to make everything as professional as possible, also in terms of image, films, sponsorships. I mean, I remember in Silt, you went up on stage and you just bust out the perfect German. I mean, didn't get that at school, did you? It's just like... 
Well, that's actually one of those things where, where I said I paid attention in high school. I, I actually, uh, I took German for two years in high school. So oh, wow. I had the base. Yeah, I went to Puno. I was really lucky to go to a good high school where you could take Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, French, or German. And at that point, I'm like, well, windsurfing is huge in Germany. I had some German fans like pen pals and like, well, everybody says German's really hard and I shouldn't take it, but I'm kind of interested in it. You know, I've been there. There's a connection. There's a lot of German windsurfers that come to Hawaii. I'm going to take German. I don't care if it's hard. And so I learned the very basic, you know, dirty, dusty, dame, de dusty, bis, durch, for, gegen, you know, the conjugating germ verbs and all that. And then traveling over the years, just listening to it, hanging out with Ralph Bachschuster and Bjorn Schrader and, you know, all those guys, it slowly kind of came in so that eventually I, I could speak it. But it, it was paying attention and getting an A in those couple of years of German in high school that gave me the base to be able to do it. So, again, I was lucky um, that I was even able to take German in high school and yeah. that I paid attention so we so we so we cross off the first urban legend that you learned to to learn german as a pro already just to you know be more appealing to the sponsors in germany and well, that whatever. was that was certainly a big part of it you know to, yeah. to be able to do that i'm sure it it helped my income over the last couple of decades for sure so we're only in the 80s <laughs> No, it's okay. Speed it up from here. Don't worry. No, all good. Okay. I didn't used to like talking about the past. I was never one of those guys that wanted to look backward. I always said, I want to look forward, but I'm enjoying looking yeah. back at this point. I'm old enough that I can appreciate yeah. the water under the bridge. Okay, so we covered one urban legend about the German language. Let's cover some more also about sponsorships. So kind of common knowledge around the beach is that at some point um, your Quicksilver contract just went into shares, basically, rather than salary. True, not true, secret, can't talk no, about it. No, not, not true. Um, signed my Quicksilver contract, the very first one in 82. Um, at that point I was sponsored by O'Neill wetsuits. That was my first paying sponsor. And at that point, wetsuit companies only made wetsuits, clothing companies only made clothing. It wasn't, you know, years later I had to decide between the two because they both grew into wetsuits, clothing, wetsuits, clothing. And I, I had to choose and, and chose to stay with Quicksilver. But, uh, no, what happened was I was sponsored until, well, until this year so i've been with quicksilver until covid and uh so 37 years under contract as a pro the entire time always paid uh contract salary until covid and unfortunately i just got got dropped uh halfway through my probably my final three-year contract because of the obvious difficulties that a lot of industries and companies are having due to COVID-19. So no, I've been a, a paid Quicksilver rider nonstop the entire time. The shares thing was again, being in the right place at the right time and, um, and seizing opportunity when it came. I was friends with the, the Australian guys um, that started Quicksilver. Uh, the guys that ran Quicksilver, head of marketing for Quicksilver at the time that I signed my first contract was a guy named Harry Hodge. Uh, I was pretty big in Europe. Windsurfing was pretty big in Europe. Surfing was pretty small. And in 1984, winter 84, 85, we formed a company called Napali SA in the south of France in St. John de Luz. So I was one of, the, one of the founding shareholders along with John Winship, Harry Hodge, Bridget Derry Grand, Jeff Hackman and myself to purchase the license for Quicksilver for Europe. I was sponsored formed. by that company actually. Right. I had a contract with, with that company, yeah. 
Awesome. So yeah, I I was a uh, one of the founders of Quicksilver Europe. There, we started out making just board shorts and t-shirts in a little tiny factory in Saint Jean de Luz. Uh, we were actually the first licensee in the world to branch out of surf clothes because we're like, okay, Europe in the winter time, who's buying board shorts, but they're buying ski jackets and whatnot. So we made the first, you know, the big neon Quicksilver jacket with the huge neon, like a black puffy jacket with a big fluorescent orange Quicksilver logo on the back. Um, kind of paved the way for Quicksilver to start expanding into different types of clothing. And uh, so I invested in that, obviously, with money it wasn't given to me. It was a big investment for me at the time. Um, but I thought it, it made sense and it was a good opportunity. And then uh, we grew it and grew it and grew it to the point until we were pretty underfinanced. We sold it to Quicksilver Inc., the American company who bought you know, Quicksilver globally uh, in 1991. And so that was a really good investment, but that was secondary to my sponsorship. Through but it must have it must have run under that name for a long, long time until it became Board Riders. I'm, I'm board wondering. Riders. It, it was Nepali up until a year and a half ago when it became exactly. Board yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I remember it being on the contract. Okay, yeah, so that's part of being a pro is you know looking at opportunities, and you know there was one, and then in nineteen. 19- 88, 89, I guess it was, uh, with Pierre Agnès, my late really good friend who became the eventual president, CEO of Quicksilver globally. Um, we started a company called Omarif together in, uh, in Cabreton, Hossegor, and we were the licensee for Quicksilver wetsuits, watches, eyewear, uh, and grew that also quite big until we sold it again to Inc. You know, several years later so i've had some really good business opportunities investing in the quicksilver brand over the years as well okay that's that was yeah that was much better than that legend than that beach legend yeah but it wasn't being being paid it was in it was investing using my money to do yeah yeah luckily good things with but through that i was always sponsored yeah beach beach legend number three windsurfing was the first sport red bull sponsored and you and Bjorn were the first athletes that Red Bull sponsored. No, um, Mr. Mateschutz, Didi Mateschutz, the the founder of Red Bull, had a really interesting philosophy in the very beginning. So, no conventional marketing, no conventional sports. Really wanted to give opportunity and shed light to, like, under the radar sports. And there were several before me Bjorn was was one of the the first in Europe I was like the first international athlete but he was sponsoring a rock climber and a um oh, there was there were several I was kind of in the second tier uh as as the first sort of non-European um luckily because it was uh a great opportunity for me. I loved the product and the way it happened is I discovered Red Bull and I have a B vitamin deficiency. I've known that since I was a little kid. If I don't take my B vitamin, I don't think straight. I, you know, luckily my pediatrician discovered that in school because I couldn't focus. I'd read a page in a book and then when I'm finished, I wouldn't even know what I read. And he's like, you know, because of Robbie's diet, because I didn't eat any vegetables, that was really bad. Maybe he's B vitamin deficient. So I started taking B supplement when I was a kid and it gives me immediate focus and clarity. So like if I would drive to the event in the morning and I forgot to take my B vitamin, I would freaking race back to the hotel to get my vitamin, take it. Cause I just don't have the the sharpness of of mind. If I don't take it, Red Bull does the same thing. You know, the, the taurine and vitamin B in Red Bull gives me that clarity. It's not like coffee where you get jittery, I can't drink a lot of coffee. I just have to run to the bathroom when I'm like this. Red Bull gives you, gives me, I say it's like sharpening my pencil, right? It it just increases your focus, your ability to concentrate, your reflexes, your mental cognitive, like being on it. And so I was like, I love this. I was buying it and putting it in my luggage and taking it home. And then finally I 
I organized a meeting with Mr. Mataschitz one year that I was at ISPO, not to necessarily go try to get sponsorship, but to see if I could maybe get a deal where I could get Red Bull in Hawaii because I loved the product and met him. That was when Red Bull was still quite small. Um, we hit it off really well. Um, you know, he obviously had windsurfed previously as well as many people in Europe. Um, and kind of the rest is history. So it wasn't like going looking for a dollar. It wasn't like in the beginning, I was only sponsored for products, no branding, no stickers, no hat kind of grew organically because at that point, you know, he didn't believe in taking a, a guy that was already a top athlete and then suddenly branding him. So I didn't start to be branded by Red Bull until we invented kite surfing. And I started running around doing the kite surfing tour, doing events, et cetera. And they're like, well, this is a new sport. We might as well brand me. And then once I was branded kiting, it was kind of weird not to be branded windsurfing. So the branding kind of grew from, from there organically. But um, that's been a, a great relationship, an amazing company, an amazing founder that, uh, you know, it still blows my mind what he's been able to do with that brand and that, that product. And uh, yeah, I'm super proud to be, to be associated with them. Definitely. Are there, are there like really fond, like outside of industry sponsorships? You've had so many over the years, you know, like, what do you, what do you remember? I mean, you guys went through anything from beer and ciggies to, you know, travel, agencies at events famously and to any kind of products really like it's nuts it's like it was like football back then yeah I mean, the events in the beginning like personally i i didn't ever have a lot of sponsors i i figured if i had a few good ones that paid me well i didn't want anymore i didn't have more space on my sale i didn't want to look like a billboard And to me, sponsorship was also time, you know, a time commitment that I didn't have. So, you know, I could have made more money by gathering more sponsors, but I never wanted it. I wanted just a few really good sponsors and not a whole bunch of little ones. So you never saw tons of little stickers on my sale. Um, that's just not what I was about and why I did it. But in terms of the industry, yeah, if you look at the 80s, for example, it was, it was Pall Mall, cigarettes peter stuyvesant cigarettes it was sometime cigarettes in japan a lot of cigarette cigarette sponsorships before that was uh outlawed um smirnoff uh there, there were definitely some some alcohol ones if you went to south africa etc uh you know when the cigarette money dried up that was the end of the really big money in windsurfing you know they kind of camouflaged it for a while like peter stuyvesant travel and uh, paul mall fashion and things like that but that that obviously didn't last either and then it started to become more tourism authorities like the canary islands places that wanted to shed light on their area from a tourist standpoint and that's kind of what it's become now i mean the only real sponsors of the the tour at the moment are you know places national Hmm. national government tourism authorities etc and the and the real outside sponsorship money for the most part has kind of dried up it's a lot more yeah. difficult to come by yeah we covered um success to some extent we covered money to some extent don't want to ask you figures um i guess fame comes with it in europe like you say it was crazy in the 80s um living in hawaii not exactly the, the, you know, the, the place you can hide or whatever. Did it get to a point where, where it became a little bit of a burden that, that you kind of, you know, had to escape to a non windsurf place from time to time or, or whatever? Not really. I, again, I was really lucky. I'm still really lucky. Just the sports that I ended up in and where I live and how everything evolved. You know, I, I had the benefit when, when windsurfing was really big, that it was big on the other side of the world, that 
nobody knew me at home. Nobody knew me in Hawaii. And then I went to Europe and, and at least in the windsurfing world was, was famous. Um, but at home, nobody would recognize me walking down the street. I'm more famous now here in Hawaii than I was in the boom of, of windsurfing because it, nobody noticed then. It wasn't in the news. Windsurfing was never a big sport here. And it, it wasn't until stand-up paddling and, and kiting to a degree and the more recent stuff that we started to get some, some focus here locally, like, you know, on the extreme sports channels and like local coverage. Like now people know who I am here, but 30 years ago, 20 years ago, they, they didn't. Yeah. So it was more from stand-up and the more recent stuff. So I had a, I was really lucky that, it didn't follow me around. I was nobody at home. And I think it, it helped keep my feet on the ground to a degree. And it was never tiring. And it's not like, Oh, there are people bothering me all the time. It was, it was never like that. And again, we're a, even at the big time of windsurfing, we were still a pretty small sport in the whole scope of, of things. Yeah. It's not like we were on TV all the time and people would recognize you on the street. And it wasn't like Boris Becker or, you know, Tiger well, Woods. Or well, except that. for except for Germany, maybe I think I think uh, Jimmy Diaz mentioned that there was like a poll in Germany for like most recognizable athletes, and it was like Boris Becker, Michael Schumacher, Robbie Nash, and then. Yeah, well, Germany's different because I've been going there for so long that yeah. eventually it's it's like you. Yeah, you, you say it's not. Over, over you time. say it's not. It's not tiring, and it's not. It's not a burden. But I remember walking down the street in, in Silt, and there's like a bunch of people, like I don't know, a hundred people, like a gathering, you know. And you think that inside maybe something happened. I don't know. Somebody's dying in there or whatever. You know, they're doing CPR on someone, or I don't know, or some, or I don't know, some art artist is in there or whatever. And I just peek over and there's, there's you just signing away, you know, just yeah. randomly on the street. So, yeah, I think you're a little modest on this, <laughs> on this part. Yeah, well, yeah, G Germany's a little different. Yeah. But I, I always appreciated it, too. I figured, you know, if somebody wanted my autograph, it was like, awesome. Uh, that's it i never looked at it as a as a burden it was like that's insane i can't believe that guy wants me to sign his t-shirt i don't know whose name i would want on my t-shirt so i always appreciate it like hell yeah i'll sign that until 10 o'clock at night if i have to if there's still a guy standing there that wants me to sign his t-shirt i'm going to stay as long as you know they want me to so yeah i always thought it was super cool yeah fast forward to the well, fast forward, not really, but fast forward to the beginning of the 90s. And in 91, you win what turned out to be your, I guess, your last um, wave world title. And then but by that time, like you say, you know, the, the racing career kind of tailored off. You're still up there in the waves for, for a couple more years. But by that time, you've been on tour for 10 years. You've been winning for 15 or whatever did it not cross your mind to to just you know venture into into something else already i mean it's like yeah you have you know you won everything that there was to win you made your money you're you know like yeah i i, I wonder what what just you know why why stay why keep going to silt you know what? I think, again, the main reason was maybe the difference between why I do this or did this, have done this, and, and why other people do. I, I never set a goal. I, knew, I was never out to accomplish something. I always did it just because it's what I do. Um, and I enjoyed it. And I I always felt so lucky to be able to do it because this is what – this is what people do when they retire. This is what people do on holidays if they save up enough money to go and actually have the equipment and the time and the spot. That's what I actually get to do every day. And I think 
I had an, enough appreciation for that and enough enjoyment out of doing it. It's not like it ever got boring. If it got boring, I, I would have stopped. But I wasn't one of those guys that like set a target, set a goal. I want to do this in life. And then when I, when I win and when I get to the top of that hill, I got to find another hill to climb somewhere. Like I'm going to start playing golf. I don't want to fucking play golf. I want to go wind surfing. I want to go ride waves. I want to, um, maybe I'm stuck in a rut, but I still enjoy this more than I enjoy anything else. Like yeah, I love cars all my cars are broken because I don't have enough time to work on my cars because I'm windsurfing and winging and surfing too much. Um, so yeah, I don't think I ever got to that point where I said, okay, that was awesome. I'm successful. Now I'm going to try something else. It's like, no, nah, this is what I do. I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> That's sick. That's sick. And but I'm, then I and guess I'm, I'm still sharing that, that stoke, which yeah. and at the end of the day, as a pro, and you can look in it different ways. Some people think they're a pro because they're really good and that's why they're getting paid or they're winning on this gear and that's why they're getting paid. And the day they stop winning, they're not going to get paid anymore. They're gone and they move on. I never looked at it that way. I looked at my sponsorships as, yeah, I, I better win if I'm competing because that's why they're paying me or at least come close. Or if I'm not winning, be doing something to make people want to buy that stuff. You know, this is about lifestyle. Not many people are windsurfing or kiting or stand up paddling because they want to go beat another guy. These are sports you do because they fill you with life. They, they, they get into your blood. You love it. They're healthy. They're fun. Their competition's a tiny little part of it. So I realized pretty early on that my sponsorship wasn't just to go get first, second, or third. It was to instill that passion into people that hopefully they go and want to buy the brand that I represent, whether it's a t-shirt or a pair of shorts or a sale or a board or, you know, a, a beverage that, and you can do that outside of competition too, right? I mean, I realized pretty early on that just the competition was not that big a part of why I was paid to do what I do and why I love to do it and how I can share the passion for these sports with other people. And like when I retired, I guess, I don't even know when I retired from competition. I, it wasn't like I stopped. I just slowly transitioned out. And to me, nothing really changed. I, I became more intense as a pro without competing than when I was competing in, in some ways in terms of trying to create value for my sponsors and to share my stoke with people. You know, I look at myself as an ambassador for, for water sports and I'm, I'm just trying to shed some of that positive light into the world and get that influence into people's lives. There's enough negative out there, right? If you look at half the shit on the internet and on TV, it's doing nothing positive for anybody. And, you know, people will say, well, what are you doing for the environment? What's your, your stay on global warming? I'm not standing on a box trying to sell politics or any agenda. The more I can connect people with the environment, the more I can get people out in the ocean, tasting the water and getting on the beach and seeing the trash on the beach and making it part of their lives and you know, getting disconnected from their phone and connected with the ocean and connected with the wind. A lot of people don't even know what direction the wind is. You and I, it's east wind, it's north wind, it's offshore, it's onshore, it's sideshore. You know, it connects you with nature in a way that most people just don't have in their lives. That is way more valuable than saying, save the turtles, uh, clean the oceans, you know, because it becomes part of their universe where it becomes important to them. Yeah. Just or, as a, or I a came third, right? Like, like you mentioned. Yeah. So it's, it's um but i mean but i mean this is the way of of i mean when you're sponsored i guess that's why the tour exists and because it's so hard to quantify sharing the stoke yeah it's so hard to quantify filling people with energy you sponsor guys you don't put as an objective there share the stoke you know? Well, we kind of do, especially, I mean, if you look at the historically, the kind of guys I sponsor, not a lot of them are always winning <laughs> you know, the tours. 
<laughs> the sharing of stokes a really big part of it um you know winning's great because if if you win you get a notoriety where where people will listen to what you have to say right you're good you created a platform there's a certain level of respect where if you're a guy that's never competed at all ever it's harder to get that notoriety but these days it can happen i mean there's really successful famous sports people that have never competed i mean look at laird hamilton you know i've known laird for a really long time he's never competed you know he knows where his value lies and uh he's taken that ball and and run with it really really well so especially in this day and age there's different ways of being a professional athlete than just being competition based especially with the internet yeah yeah we'll get to sponsorships and all that but before we need to talk about how you even got into the business and i guess like 95 gastra gets gets sold to i think who is still now the owner owner knut knut burig um knut was way way after that oh ah, yeah sorry yeah you know yeah. i was born in 91 so yeah no this is way, this is it had been bought and sold and bought and sold and bought and sold and it was bought by a a, a hong kong based company and um i just i didn't want to do the big go around again they were going to bring in a managing director that i had worked with a couple of owners previous and i just didn't think that was the direction i wanted to go again and they wanted to dismantle the team that we had built on maui the r&d team because we were doing all the development here with don montague pete cabrina me uh and a a guy named um pat corral and they wanted to dismantle the whole hawaii thing and move all the development to hong kong and i was like Fuck. i didn't want to do that and i wasn't going to go like sign with neil pride after all those years with gastro that wouldn't have been at all believable right and so it seemed the only option was to try and keep the team together and that's when we formed nash sales hawaii which was a huge decision i really didn't want to do it it was like oh my god yeah i was about to say i was about to say we're talking all about sharing the stoke and being on the beach and and whatever and and knowing what you know now you know that it's basically strapping yourself to a fucking computer for yeah know. well back, back then computers were a small part of it and not like today but yeah it was a big decision i was like god do i really want to do this you know um but we were small all we made is sales you know and there was no no target to ever be bigger than that i was like oh, let's just keep our our team together you know pete was doing the marketing don was doing the designs pat was doing the admin it was like okay we'll just keep it small make wind surfing sales and it kind of it kind of grew from there yeah it didn't it didn't really work out to stay small did it um well, it did because it was super gradual and slow the way it evolved you know we started doing kites in developing in 98 got the license for the first inflated struts from bruno legagno to start making nash kites for the 99 in 99 for the 2000 season you know so we were five years of just doing windsurfing sales and then obviously got into kiting and that took us to a whole new level with the the birth of kite surfing yeah and then somewhere in the meantime i don't know the exact timeline but uh, for years you had the skull on your mistral your nash logo on on your mistral boards and that kind of i have no idea what happened there but but was that again like obvious okay now i have sales fuck it let's just do boards as well yeah because you know we were doing sales we started doing kites kite boards and then it was like i mean we were doing all our own boards anyway right the, the mistral nash boards my dad and i had been doing all the development for the mistral board since geez 1979 basically so it just became kind of a natural thing that should, we should just take these in as well um and then yeah prop prop boards into it whenever that was <laughs> i don't even remember yeah. sometime after 2000 2002 something like that yeah. so knowing what you know now you'd still still start nash sales <laughs> yeah because it's i don't know where i'd be right now had i not done that and, and what i'd be doing i mean there have been some headaches and bumps in the road but i've learned a lot it's been mostly fun um 
I still own it. I've never made mistakes big enough to, to tank and, and lose everything. Uh, it's still fun, you know, for the most part. Sometimes I think we make too much stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to juggle the amount of, of product and sports that we're in sometimes, but it's also super fun because I still want to do all those, all those sports and ride all that stuff. So it's selfish and self-serving in a certain way because most of it I ride myself. So, um, but yeah, I'd, I'd do it again. I might not do it exactly the same, you know, but I'd probably still do it. Yeah. I mean, you could be, you could be sitting, you know, renting out a couple, couple places in Hawaii and whatever, and just windsurfing. Right. But again, I think we're coming back to goals and motivation and all that. And I don't know, I guess that doesn't from, from the, how this conversation is going, I guess that's not, that's not your thing really to, to just, um, yeah. Get fat under a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. I, I love what I do. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's keeping me, so if that, not so young, it, it's keeping me young at heart and, and healthy at least. So, so then you, you have to sort of at some point transition into some sort of managerial role, I would say. And with that, you know, your brand gets bigger and you start sponsoring writers. So let's talk a little bit about writers a lot of people in this industry i feel like are ex-competitors or ex somehow involved you know if you look at probably 90 percent of the brand managers of the you know of the companies that are out there were somewhat competitive people and i get this feeling like a lot of those people when they hire a rider or when they look they look through their own as you do in life, right? You look through your own experience and you sort of compare maybe to yourself a little bit. How was that for you? Because I mean, there, there's not going to be another Robbie Nash, you know, there's, it's just. It's... Yeah, it was for me. And I, I was never the one that would sit across the table and for example, talk about contracts or money. Um, because I always wanted to be a writer first and the, the business has always been secondary. And, and even to this day, I don't sit in on contract discussions. That's not the relationship I want to have. I'm a pro writer in my eyes still as they are. And that's the way I want to be viewed. Obviously there's, you know, it's a little different because I'm freaking 50, whatever now, but, in their eyes, they see an old guy. In my eyes, I'm still a rider and I want to go ride with them and have fun. And it's, I've always put that responsibility, even if I'm, you know, partial or involved with making the decisions, I'm not sitting across the table looking a guy in the eye talking about his contract. It's just not what I want to do in life. And so it's been pretty good for me because I don't have to put my, you know, I'm not comparing to myself. I, I have a certain, you know, perspective of what a guy should do. We're a certain size, you know, like in windsurfing, we've never been a big company. We've always been really small. We've, we've had lots of really good riders over the years that we, we get them up to a certain level and then they go off to a bigger company that can pay them more and then they win a world title. And that's fine. You know, we, we've never been in a position to try to be the biggest, you know, we, we are what we are. And my relationship with riders, whether they're on Nash or used to be on Nash, sponsored by someone else, I look at them as like brothers in arms. They're, they're fellow riders. It's, I don't look at them that he's sponsored by Duotone or he's sponsored by uh, Ezzy or he's Gastra. Fuck. I look at them that, fuck yeah, there's a guy, one of my friends, making a living or at least getting paid to do what he loves to do. There's never any uh looking at it negatively or or from the sponsorship standpoint like you can talk to any one of the guys that used to ride for nash that went on to ride for other people there's never any 
bad yeah. blood yeah. unless they're an asshole or do something really stupid which has only happened maybe twice in all of these years of of doing it otherwise i'm still really good friends with them i wish them well you know like jesse richmond you know someone comes and offers him way more money i'm like dude fuck yeah take it awesome i wish i could pay you that much but i can't go for it i'm stoked for you you know i i want pro riders to do as best they can i'd love for everyone to be able to make a million dollars a year windsurfing uh, they don't have to be sponsored by nash so mm. i i think the the fact that i come from number one being a writer at heart and not a businessman gives me a different perspective a little less maybe cutthroat than than others and maybe why we're we've never been that big because the business side has never been the priority yeah but but to some extent you are the face of that whole operation right sure, yeah, so whenever sure. some shitty situation some shit hits the fan or whatever like like the very <laughs> Like the latest one with Nash's corporate America and whatever, you know, yeah, everybody that, thinks that was, of, one, that was one of the ones I was just talking about. Yeah. It's kind of you. Nobody thinks of you have probably 20 people or whatever working for you. Nobody thinks about that. That was an odd one. You know, you, you always try to be empathetic, you know, and everybody's different everybody looks at things differently and every and yeah, and yeah it's going to reflect on me and it is it is what it is but once in a while you get somebody where you try to see things from their perspective but then you realize they have their head so far up their ass that you could never get your head up your ass that far to see from their perspective. So you just got to go, fuck it. And that was one of those cases where there was just no rationality about it. Uh, that's amazing. Normally I'm very, very empathetic and I can see where people are coming from. And yes, I'm wrong. A lot of the time, I don't know everything. There's no question. And sometimes, you know, what we need and what someone else needs are different. And I go, yeah, I, I get it. You know, where it is what it is. It doesn't happen very often, though, where it's that. Yeah. Yeah, that was, well, to anybody that hasn't seen, we're talking about an ex-rider that just lashed yeah. out on. It was also undeserving, you know, which is why we were so adamantly defended, you know, by so many people that were familiar with it, that know that we're not Yeah. like that. So. And there was a big discussion about, custom boards and you know like not using actually the nash product and and whatever and it's funny because another beach legend beach legend number 68 is like Cauli and brausinho left the boards side at least because robbie wouldn't let them use custom boards you know so right. There you go, another legend there for you, true for true or false. Yeah, I mean it's it's always been a dilemma in the industry, especially like in the early days, nobody wrote production anything. You couldn't write a production board. There was no way <laughs> they weren't good enough. That changed, you know, with the onset that the production boards today are. 90% custom anyway uh, for, for even the bigger brands that are molding them. Yeah. Some less so, but like our wave boards, every single one is custom. I don't have any molds for the wave boards. They're all CNC. So they're, they're made just like any guy with a, an Aku machine or whatever would be making custom at, at home. So, you know, the, the times have changed and evolved with the technologies and for us, especially because we do so few boards, everything we do is custom, you know, even, even the stuff coming from our factories, it's not molded for, at least for, for wave riding. So it's, it's different back then. Yeah. You know, we needed our guys to ride production boards because that's what we were selling. And, you know, we wanted a believable endorsement. Mm. And in, in that time period, I probably stuck too much to my guns. 
there's also a cost thing. You know, we were still pretty small and the cost of doing tons and tons of custom boards and whatnot just didn't, didn't fit the way we were trying to promote the brand, but it changes and evolves over time. You know, every, every year is different than the last year. Yeah. And it's amazing because Cali and Brasino turned into like the two biggest gear board freaks there probably was in the last, you know, yeah. last year. So that's, that. Yeah, well, Francisco is on the team too. Right. So, I mean, we've had a lot of really good riders, uh, with the brand. And again, there's never hard, almost never uh, hard feelings. Like when I see Cauli, when I see Brasino, when I see Francisco, when I, I don't, I don't ever look at them with a negative light that, Oh, I wish you were still with Nash. It's like, Fuck yeah, how you doing? God, you're killing it. That was awesome. It's, yeah. it's um, in my eyes, a hundred percent, not even 99%, but a hundred percent stoke. Yeah. I, I never have a bad feeling that, you know, yeah. oh, I wish they were still with us. Yeah, and you got pretty, like, the brand from a competitive type image or rider type image, you got pretty big, like, in the mid-2000s. You even had a race team, race gear, um, really good race sales, actually, with Dan Kassler and, you know, and, uh, yeah, like, really competitive PWA stuff and, you know, wave team and, yeah, just just you know, looked quite big. And then all of a sudden it felt like it just, somebody decided, okay, we're not a competitive brand anymore. Now we're like the fun, like now we're gonna do gear for the average Joe just to make him have fun. Right. You know, was that a conscious thing or that just kind of happened over time or? It, it kind of happened over time when the sport, the industry, however you want to put it, kind of started consolidating a lot, right? Um, you know, the windsurfing industry used to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of units per year. And now it's less than 100,000 units a year. It's uh, and getting smaller, you know, pretty much all the time. And unfortunately for us, I wish and again, it's a lot of it's probably management. And if, if I sat behind a desk all day and stopped doing all this fun stuff, or I had different management in place, maybe it would be different. But at the end of the day, a lot of decisions have to be drawn by economics. And if you sell 100 race sales in a year at a shit margin, it's kind of hard to have a race team. It's hard to even justify developing the sales. Um, if you sell four slalom boards in a year, it's kind of hard to have, you know, even one team rider who alone is going to have 12 slalom boards or whatever. So some of the decisions are made for you purely by economics, where once the, the expenses start to supersede the income in a category, as much as you'd like to, to support it, you just can't. And that, for example, PWA racing for us was just, we had to stop doing it because it, you know, we weren't winning. No one was buying our race stuff and the investment required to get to that level based on our, how Nash is structured. We were never going to get there anyway, being based in Hawaii, selling to distributors who then sell to dealers who then sell to end consumers. We're at such a disadvantage to a European based brand who's selling straight to the dealers and can feed opinion leader product straight into the market, whether it's RRD or Duotone, Fanatic, whoever it is, um, there's one layer of distribution added with, with Nash, which makes it kind of economically unviable. So that, that may change in the future, but. Yeah. Did you feel like the industry kind of turned like it used to be all Hawaii? You know, everything used to be Maui, 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 fins, boards, everything developed in Maui and whatever. And like 20 years or 15 years go by and you're like one of the only ones left in Maui. You know, like you say, everybody's in Europe and it's, yeah. Do you feel like that was part of, part of the whole thing? You, you feel maybe, you know, like it just, you feel left out in some ways. No, no, not really. I mean, it's that's part of the reality of the business, but that's just the business. Um, and again, the business has never been the priority. Um, yeah. 
we would be structured differently if the business was the full priority. It, it doesn't mean it, it won't be in the future. Um, you know, maybe we're going to change and adapt with the times. The internet has changed everything, right? It's, it's changed the way people get their information. It's changed the way people get their entertainment. It's changed the way people purchase things. And, you know, we need to evolve with that to a certain degree uh, as well um, from a business standpoint, which we are, you know, we're not the fastest guys to adapt to, to new technologies and times because we're too busy riding because we live in Maui and it's too good to ride here. If we lived in, I don't know, Mulln or Munich or something, we'd probably be focusing on the business way better than we are sitting here on Maui. Uh, but I think we have a pretty good balance this way. You know, we're, we're still um, stoked with what we're doing and you know we're we're heading in the right direction not the wrong yeah. direction you know from a from a business standpoint from a dollars and cents standpoint yeah it does seem like it's night and day either you're in some brands are in maui and the others are in fucking bavaria or whatever like there's no yeah. in between come on guys <laughs> like or thailand you know right right at the production or... yeah insane yeah but you did lately get a little push back into you know into kind of that PWA professional scene. You got two new writers. Not the best time probably to hire a PWA <laughs> writer, but but it is what it is. Um, was that in any ways like, I don't know, did you get a new brand manager for windsurfing or was that you like getting stoked on the Aloha Classic or was it, you know, what, what led or is it just pure economics? You see windsurfing kind of hit the bottom and bounce back like by half a percent I, it's certainly not economics but I, I just think that the brand needs to be um stronger in windsurfing than it is and that is going to require some investment just from a, a pride standpoint not neil pride but pride um you know windsurfing's in my heart it's where i come from i don't want to give people the impression that like i'm abandoning it just because it's not a great business model um so we're kind of reinvesting in it just because i want to um i have a new brand manager who doesn't you know scott trudon windsurfed in the 80s really good guy here from maui comes from kind of a different background he was the the main guy at the kind here for years and i just wanted somebody in that isn't me isn't mickey schweiger doesn't you know have any history fresh blood come in balance out the team for all sports and let's let's give it some push and so we're we're doing that in kiting quite strongly we have a really solid young motivated team in kiting tons of fresh blood uh windsurfing i'd like to do the same thing i i want to see like i don't want to be bigger than duotone uh, fanatic but i want to be bigger than we are right now and i want to support riders i don't want people to think oh yeah you've abandoned your sport even if it's bringing in money that we're earning in other sports, windsurfing needs to be given a little bit more love. And so bringing in Ricardo, he's been asking me for years and it just wasn't, you know, it didn't make sense. And in the end, I'm like, fuck it. I don't care if it makes sense. Let's do it anyway. And it's been so cool having him on the, the team, the motivation, seeing him like he's, he's riding better than ever. His attitude is insane. Like he was a loose cannon there a few years in the past, like when you'd see him and Martin Brandner fighting, you know, the, the, the head guy from JP, it was like, holy shit. Um, he's grown up, he's matured. He knows what he wants. He's riding really well. He's loving the gear. You know, we're really letting him be involved with the development board sales, whatever. I can ride anything. I can adapt. I mean, you see me riding quads now. I'd rather be on a single fin, but I can ride anything. People always say, oh, the Nash gear is weird because Robbie's making gear that he likes. It's like, nah, I will ride anything. You could put me on a McDonald's tray, you know, glued to a piece of wood with a little sheet. I will go make that fun. So I'm letting the team guys really kind of take control of the direction they want to go and try and, you know, let them take the sport to the next level. It has been a weird season to, to start to resurrect it with obviously everybody being tied down, but it's, it's different. And um, sometimes different is good. 
you know, in, in ways that you didn't expect. You know, having Ricardo here for all this time was really good for him uh, to focus on his riding and his gear. It was great for us to have him around. Um, you know, and I, I see that continuing. I, I'm feeling the stoke. We're feeling the energy. If you look at our new product line, we have stuff coming out like for S25 that's really different. Like, you know, I've got some foiling sales and stuff. That's, it's super fun. You know, we're not gonna win the PWA racing foil discipline, but I think that's probably gonna kind of disappear with the Olympic foiling class taking over now anyway. I think that's the future of windsurf racing here for the next couple of years is, is the, uh, the Olympic class. Um, but in waves and freestyle and pff, the sport is definitely going back up. Yeah. yeah. It's too cool not to, there's too much energy. The level is so insane. And, um, and I want to be part of it, you know, maybe not personally, but emotionally connected with the brand, supporting other guys. I want to, I want to be there yeah. with windsurfing. Into the yeah, it's great to hear you kind of still, you know, follow a little bit and, and whatever, because I don't know, does that hurt you when you hear, like you mentioned, like people were like, ah, fucking Robbie turned his back on, on the sport that brought him everything, you know, and, and whatever. Does that get like, you know, because you could be, I mean, Pete Cabrinha is a windsurfer. He doesn't make, make windsurf gear. Like Craig, Craig from Fanatic told me that like, fucking Robbie could be, doesn't need to do this, you know? He could close his windsurf division. Doesn't need to make any gear, actually. You know, like yeah. Does, well, economic, it... Economically, we should have closed the windsurfing division years ago, but it's we're not doing it for the economics of it. I mean, again, that's that was never the reason I started the business in the first place. So it but, is a little personal when you hear that shit. <laughs> well, not from a business standpoint, because I've never abandoned it personally. You know. And, like if I stopped windsurfing, that would be different. Like if I stopped windsurfing, the business at the end of the day, you know, you, you have to make money because you're, I, it's not just Robbie Nash that I'm looking out for. I've got the, you know, all my employees and their families and their, their health insurance and their mortgage. And, and that's when you have to start looking at things from a different perspective of, does this make sense? Does, okay, it doesn't make sense, but how much does it not make sense? Right. If it was only me, fuck, I could do whatever I want, but I'm responsible to a certain degree or the decisions that, that we make. I'm responsible for a whole lot of people's livelihoods and families that they depend on. So, you know, it can't just be emotional fun and games. Um, you know, we need to be smart at the same time. And right now I think we can do both because we're doing, we're doing well financially even through covid i think we positioned ourselves in a really good way timing wise product wise that we've actually done amazingly well through covid where other brands were like nearly ready yeah. to shut the doors we paid all our riders in all sports 100 percent through the whole thing we never cut anybody back i never laid off any employees it was like we just ran through it crossing our fingers and in the end of the day we were lucky because people were home buying this kind of stuff and i think the nash brand is as um being more appreciated in the landscape of choices now than maybe it was in in certain categories before uh, a lot of the brands especially in some of the other sports that that we're involved with have come and gone you know people that get into a sport when it's big and trendy and new you know they they get into it in the beginning they and then they disappear and we've always been in for the long haul. And I think people are starting to appreciate that. And things like stand up, for example, where we're doing quite well again. Yeah. So. And everybody in stand up is the best example of the sport that has just boomed and then just tailed off massively, I would guess. But part of why you're doing so well has to be winging, right? And recognizing that trend, having it starting in maui you know and and yeah. i think yeah well, I mean, we could we could be doing better we didn't you know we didn't set ourselves up for the the boom that we we, we you know launched it for a lot of other people you know when we started i kept telling my guys you watch how many brands are going to be in this in a year 
You can have every winter brand, every kite brand, every foil brand, and then a whole bunch of other generic brands as well. And already there's like 50 brands and probably another 50 coming. So it's getting pretty, pretty flooded, but we did get in the beginning of something, you know. Yeah, because the technology is just, it's just a kite tube, right? With a little bit of windsurfing know-how maybe. Yeah. You know, like some of the wings are better than, than others, obviously. But... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a massive difference. But yeah, we're, we're definitely excited about what's happening in, in winging and it's, it's going to be huge. It's insane. If you look here at the demographic doing it on Maui already, you know, a year ago, I was the only guy out there. Um, like in Kahului Harbor, that was my testing spot where I could go secret and test new foils and stuff and nobody would see. Now there's like 50 guys in the harbor with this chain of beginners learning, learning, learning. Kanaha, you know, there's you know, 20 kiters out and 10 windsurfers and 30 wings. And the interesting thing is the, the demographic of those. It's, it's kids. There's eight year old and 10 year old and my daughter, 13 year old and her friends, lots of kids winging um, as well as the old guys. So it's, it's the broadest demographic that I've seen, you know, even more than kiting, more than stand up in the beginning. Is it so, so you reckon it's here to stay? Like it's, it's not just another flick, you know, like. Yeah. Given the popularity and again, given the broad range of appeal, I think this one is really interesting. I mean, yeah. here, again, we've been doing it longer on Maui than most places. But if you, if you come to the North Shore of Maui now, you'd think wings been around for 20 years. They are everywhere. And it's, again, I, I couldn't get a 10-year-old kid interested in windsurfing or kiting without bribing them a new iphone or something you know obviously there's there's some but there's not enough right yeah and every little kid wants to wing there's an appeal there that i don't understand that is it's so close to windsurfing foiling yeah it's although same. yeah it's way easier than windsurf foiling though windsurf foiling is really hard even if you're a good windsurfer and you learn to wing foil in half an hour, even if you've never foiled before and never windsurfed. So it's much, much, much easier and you get good way faster. And unlike windsurf foiling, which is really fun in light wind and really scary in strong wind, even if you're a good guy, this is easy in all winds. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because the power goes straight through your body into the wing. There's not that disconnect of the sail going into the board that, you know, the triangulation of power windsurf foiling is tricky. Um, yeah, you can depower. You, you can depower the 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 wing, right? Just yeah, and when you get a gust or a lull, it translates right through your body into the foil. There's no delay or disconnect. Where windsurfing, you you get in a gust, it kind of pushes the foil down. You get into a hole, the foil wants to come up. And even if you're really good and using really specialized gear, you you kind of have to be pretty good to get it. You know, even if you're going to go with a little tiny sail and cruise the way I like to, to windsurf foil, it's certainly harder than, than wing foiling. Like my daughter, Christina, she can windsurf, you know, kind of. She's not in the foot straps, not in the harness. You can kind of go and make it back almost to the same spot. On the wing, she's flying everywhere. She wants to jump. Her, she's out there with her friends, jiving. She's jiving in the air. Like, I barely even jive in the air. So... It's interesting the appeal and the the learning curve and how much fun you can have just mowing the lawn. Like I'm saying right now, yeah. If you if you have a sport where you got a little wind and you got a lake and you're going to mow the lawn, kiting, windsurfing, or winging. Right now, I pick winging. It's the best mow the lawn sport yeah. at the moment. So yeah, today I saw a meme saying I think there was like Kai from his video where he was trying to go as fast as as possible on the wing. Right. And it's like, and it said like, okay, so now you put a boom and buttons on your, on your wing. And soon you're going to discover that if you plug it in your board, you're going to go even right. faster. Yeah. And then you're going to reinvent windsurfing. Good on you. Like, right. do you see that coming? Or, like the or, or the guys 
or the guys that are putting strings on the wing and you see them like holding the wing with strings and say, yeah, well, that's kite surfing. You know, we have that too. So, Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's really funny seeing this. It's really, really funny. I guess as a windsurfer, you just don't have the, the perspective to. Yeah. I mean, still for me, nothing beats. If you want to go really fast, windsurfing is the best vehicle in the universe. Like I'm going fast on the wing. Like if it's windy, but I'm not going as fast as I go on my Not even close. And it's a little awkward on the wing, right? While in yeah. windsurfing, you just, ah, you just put the hammer so, down and it just, yeah. Yeah, you can scare yourself, but it's totally safe. Going really fast on the wing is scary. You know, it's not as scary as going fast on a windsurf hydrofoil. That's super scary because the crashes are so gnarly. But a slalom board is still the best way to go fast. A wave board is still the best way to ride waves by far. Uh, and if you want to jump super high in flat water, kiting is still, you know, I'm jumping pretty high on the wing, but I can jump four times higher on a kite. If you really want to just get huge air, kite surfing is still the way to go. So there's a time and a place for everything. And um, to me, whatever gets people on the water is, is a good thing. Yeah. This is just getting a lot of people on the water that, you know, maybe they'll come to kiting and windsurfing from there, but this is a starting point for a lot of people that um, yeah, wouldn't kite or windsurf otherwise. Like a lot of surfers, a lot of foiler guys that have never had any interest in wind sports, they're all winging here. It's freaking windy, isn't it? And it's pretty flat it's, for the it's, summer. It's been so windy. It's been too windy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's insane, that, that whole winging thing. Okay, so now that we established you're doing pretty well, I need to plug in a question from our producers. I promised. I'm sorry. <laughs> the question is, when are you going to start supporting Windsurfing TV? That's the question. I didn't even know about Windsurfing TV until um, the email about your podcast. And I listened briefly to the, uh, the Josh Angulo segment. So I knew what it was I was talking about. So yeah. maybe soon, since soon. now I know what it is. Yeah. Okay ticked off the plug um what's the wh where do you see like you've been good at taking the trend milking it and kind of you know and there's a new trend nash is always making gear for it and whatever you we just touched on it but where do you see like the the future of of water sports in general you know like is foiling the thing it kind of brings everything together Like I can talk to a kite foiler now. I would never talk to a twin tip guy, you know? You know what I mean? Like, but I don't know. Like, what do you think? It's, it's, it's actually an exciting time. I think finally there's something new after first time in my lifetime, there's something really new, you know? So. Yeah, I've, I've always been a really bad um, sort of visionary for what's coming in the future until it's there and we're playing with it. Um, usually right about when you start getting bored, something new comes along that you didn't expect. Uh, but for sure in, in the sailing world, it's all about foiling at the, at the moment without question, which is crazy because it's, it's not new, right? It's been around forever. It's just the time is right. The technology is right. The, the market uh, in various capacities was, was there. I think America's cup, really helped draw some some focus onto foils. Um, and now if you look at what's happening in, in sailboat, you know, sail foiling, it's insane. Windsurfing, obviously it's it's the Olympic future. It's it's super cool. Kite foil racing, if if you look at what those guys are doing, it's freaking insane. That's like so high performance. Um, the windsurfing racing. somehow doesn't go any faster on a foil though. Like sailboats no, do, you, kite, kites you, do. But you actually go slower, except in really light wind. I mean, in, in light wind up to, say, 15 knots, you're faster on the foil. Beyond that, once you get into 18, 20 knots, you're definitely faster not on the foil, at least the current way that windsurf foils are, are being used. I'm still not convinced windsurfing that the type of foil that we're using is really optimizing what, what's there. 
trying to balance and teeter totter on that little airplane. It works for winging. It works really well for kiting. I think we could come up with something better for windsurfing. I've More America's Cup beginning. style. Yeah, just just triangulating the lift off of one point. You know, uh, whether it's you know T foils, elf, just something different where you, where you get less wetted surface spread further apart, and then someone will come up with it, and then it'll be super cool. Um, it works now, but it's not optimized. I think the way it could be, because you're right. You know the the America's Cup boats are going nearly 40 knots and 12 knots of wind. You know, there's a, there's a lot more potential there um, than what we're capitalizing on. And someone will do it. It won't be me, but hopefully someone will do it. And then I can check out what they're doing and, and play with it and make some of my own. But uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting times. It's um, there's a lot of fun development. There's a lot of ways to get out on the water and have fun. You don't need to be, super super good to do it which is bringing a lot of like old windsurfers back to windsurfing right if you have 12 knots on a lake for and you used to windsurf 20 years ago getting on a foil now you get that thrill it's it's accessible it's achievable you're not gonna you know take six months to learn it you're gonna get out there in one day and start having fun and it the cool thing is foiling brings fun back to average conditions that people have at home you don't have to go to Torbalay. You don't have to fly to the Canary Islands. You don't have to go to Tarifa to have fun windsurfing, you know, and, and that will help the sport. Being able to go out on your local lake and go blasting around regardless of what the wind is doing um, is going to help. Yeah, we did that Olympic um, promotional event in Lake of St. Moritz. You would never think to, you would never even like look at that lake. You would be like windsurfing here. No way. You know, like... Silva Plana? No, no, yeah. the other, so, like yeah. before oh, the, the before the proper event in Silva Plana, there is a lake yeah. in St. Moritz that would yeah, be yeah. on like a show with, with, um, Oils. like just 10 guys. Yeah. 10 guys. And, nice. and it was, yeah. And, but, and, and I think this is what the windsurfer was, right? You could just go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we're into maybe, yeah. Still in my lifetime, maybe it'll happen. Who knows? Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> You're pretty <Yeah>. young. So. <laughs> where, 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 you, where do you see y yourself in the future of, of all that? I mean, you're still got like 20 years from now, you're in, in Hokipa with your pink sail, throwing a backside turn with your top lower than your, than your board or? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, um, motivation wise, yeah, I, I see doing this until my body doesn't let me anymore you know that's the thing slowly i'm wearing myself out but i i'm eating good and you know just my my joints are getting kind of sore you know like yeah but you came but back I, pretty strong from that nasty injury yeah, from the you pelvis. Had. Yeah. yeah that still bothers me a little bit the, the two well the, there's four screws in the front that get a little sore if i do certain things but, you know, it's more just elbows and shoulders and my lower back. But, frick, I'm still probably in, in better shape than most 20-year-olds. So I, I don't see it holding me back much, you know. Yeah. I, hopefully, I'm still doing push loops in 15 years at Hokipa. Yeah. So. You're not one of the kiters that say that winging kills your arms. <laughs> no, winging is frick. I can wing all day. There's so little power in it. I Jumping. Know, Jumping went, takes a bit of, of force, but no, you can wing all day. But the and first time I went, a kiter stopped me and he's like, hey, how are you winging for so long? It just destroyed my arms in like 15 minutes. I'm like, oh my God. You guys yeah. spending too much time in his harness. Yeah. Exactly. But it's the same. I can windsurf foil for ages with no harness. But I mean, I'm not going with a seven, eight, right? If you use a big sail, you got to have a harness. But I, I love doing stuff that, is just totally free, no harness, and, and go blasting around. So you I've did still compete got plenty. without a harness, so maybe that's where it comes from. Yeah, we didn't have harnesses were illegal all the way until uh, the marathon in '78, '79. Harnesses became legal. So three yeah, years, a lot of three years people. competitive life without a harness. Yeah, nice. and you'd go out for like back-to-back -back triangle races with no harness. Yeah. Yeah. So got some power in the arms. Yeah. 
Okay. We've been talking for ages, but we still have a little segment. We, we ask all the guys the same questions. So hope, hopefully, let's see how you do. Okay. What are your pet peeves? Uh, cigarette smoking. People that talk too much. That's us right now. Um, well, not like that. Pe people that just talk to hear themselves talk. Um, not thinking before you talk. Um, bad drivers. Cell phones. Um, I'm getting more and more as I get older. So, but that, yeah. that's good. Grump, gr everybody, I think, yeah. Grumpy is, is comes, grumpiness comes with age, I guess. Old and grumpy. Yeah, I'm trying not to be old and grumpy. I'm a grandfather twice already, so I'm, I'm trying to be a, a fun, happy grandfather. Yeah. Congratulations on that. How many times a day do you pee your wetsuit is the original question, but I guess pee your board shorts is the... You know, I'm, I'm in the lucky position where I don't even have to go places to wear a wetsuit very often, but usually never unless I'm like in the water and I can do the instant flush. But I'm not just going to pee in it, like film again, just like standing there in the tent. Not going to happen. <laughs> Guilty pleasure. Yeah. Yuck. No. no. <laughs> what is what is your guilty pleasure? That's the next question. Not <laughs> being your. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant that was Phil McGain's guilty pleasure. No. Uh, uh, guilty pleasure. Combustion engine cars. Sick. Um, three apps you can't live without apps yeah as you said you hate cell phones oh. so that might be not the best suited none I, I could live without any app all day long wouldn't miss it at all top three waves. that's super old school <laughs> top three waves ridden i mean like spots waves spots yeah uh I mean, I have to include Hokipa just because it's so good so often. Um, so I'd include Hokipa, Cloud Break, Fiji. Um, and the next one, be a tough call. Backyards, Jaws, Happy Tea in Tahiti. Um, I guess I'd say Jaws before it got crowded. Backyards, if I had to to include all times, because it's never crowded. Hmm. Um, your top five windsurfers of all time. Of all time? Yeah. Who? That's tough, because my all time goes a long way back. Um, She, you know that that'd be a hard one because if if you if you make a list of five, you're really leaving out some guys that deserve to be on that list. And so I'm just going to name a few that had you know profound effect on the sport, but it's it's a really short list. Because otherwise, you you got to include more people. This sport has had a lot of really, really, really good um, personalities, competitors, uh, opinion leaders, uh, influencers. But you, you'd have to say for sure, uh, Bjorn Dunkerbeck. You'd have to say um, Jason Polakow. You'd have to say. Uh, Antoine Albo, um, throw yourself in there. You got four. I, I, I would hope I would be in in the list somewhere. Uh, and and after that, 
there's a good 10 to 15 guys that, that deserve to be on the list as well that I could, you know, throw out, but I'd really want to think about it because if you, if you leave one of them off, that'd be super lame. Like I said, there's a lot of guys that deserve credit, but th those guys, Antoine, because he's continued to stay current for such a long time in, in multidisciplines and stay passionate and stay completely committed to the sport, um, exemplary. You know, windsurfing is weird that it's had guys that have stayed, you know, amongst the top for a really long time. That's not historically in most sports you know, the case. You know, Bjorn for a long time. I did for a long time. But then in terms of who influenced things, you know, profoundly, of, of course, I had some influence. Bjorn had massive influence um, through his reign. Uh, Jason really influenced wave sailing through that time. Um, you know, a lot of people thereafter reinforcing and taking things to a whole new level, but there's a group of them, you know, it's, you know, if, if you name one, you got to name a whole bunch. Yeah. Most underrated windsurfer of all time. Most underrated windsurfer of all time. I probably don't even know. Um, because if he's underrated to that level, then he's probably not even on my radar and deserves to be, uh, yeah. you know, my, my realm of keeping tabs on where the sport is, has waned juggling as much as I juggle. I'm not on the Windsor forums. I'm not, you know, I'm not staying current to who's the hot kid in Pozo. Uh, like, you know, I probably should be if windsurfing were my total focus. There's just not enough hours in the day to juggle everything. So, most underrated currently, I have no idea. Most underrated historically, I don't know. Historically, nobody was underrated because there were guys that were like making money that weren't even very good. <laughs> so, it's a lot harder for guys now. You got really, really talented guys that have no sponsors at all. Where, man, if you could jibe around a few buoys back in the old day, you were already like sponsored and on tour. So, I think the most underrated guys, probably somebody right now that deserves a lot more um, than he's able to get. Yeah. So, and I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. So I just yeah. say, good luck, make it happen. I'm not sure if you even know what that is, but foil freestyle, yes or no, as a discipline, as a... Uh, I mean, the, everything is possible. I mean, when you see the stuff guys are doing, it's it's insane i don't think it's necessary um but there are guys that are going to go out there all day and do insane stuff we'll see if, if there's enough guys at some point to get to a level where they can do something other than youtube videos with it it'd be cool but right now i don't think it's yeah. it's there like they want to do kite foil freestyle on the gka tour I, I think just because something can be done doesn't necessarily mean it should be done in a competitive format um you know they're already thinking the same thing with wing there's already two wing foil associations that are like let's do this and this or here's the rules for this discipline it's like it doesn't even exist yet and they already want to like go have pro events i think things should be given breathing room and time to evolve and percolate and but for sure guys if you see what, what guys are doing, even in the waves on Windsor foils and, and in dead yeah. flat water, absolutely. Yeah, you say, But there's only you say, a few guys. Yeah, you say that, but when you were that guy, you were dying for these events and for that tour to happen, right? That's what I'm saying. As soon as there's enough guys uh, so, to so, actually so have it. You don't want it to like, be like, like freestyle in the early days where it was embarrassing to see it because there were only a few guys that could do the tricks. As soon as there's enough guys that you can actually go and perform yeah. at a reasonable level. Absolutely. Yeah. And in Somehow the meantime, every, every sport needs that top of the pyramid thing. I don't know. Yeah, like the, kiting, the I think got, got, got screwed badly because it didn't have that for a while. You didn't know like who's the best kiter. You know, who's because well, there were three, four world champions and four different tours running around. Yeah, it was yeah. not good. I yeah. agree. And to a certain extent, windsurfing is specialized like that as well. True. But True. 
but now if you think to have an overall champion now like you guys did back in the day it's pretty hard to nobody, imagine isn't nobody it? does all the disciplines yeah it's it's no. very specialized but yeah i mean i'm mean, sure it's it's going to happen it's a way to get out and be windsurfing and doing freestyle in less wind which is critical you know yeah whatever we can do in less wind and more accessible conditions competition wise it's going to be good for the sport yeah you know as long as as long as the level is such that you know you can you can watch it and not have everybody leave yeah like some of the early freestyle it was painful to watch you know it was like it was better not to do it but yeah. now it's obviously totally different yeah <laughs> obstacles in slalom yes or right. no uh like just shove a sausage you know don't put this whole super x thing but just shove a sausage yeah. if it's it depends on the wind limits you know if they're smart and reasonable about it you know if guys are out on 80 centimeter wide boards and friggin 80 centimeter fins in 10 knots trying to jump over a sausage and half of them are catching their fin on the thing and falling because they're underpowered that does more harm than than good but for sure anything you can do to make it more exciting and to make skill other than just boat speed a bigger part of it is cool like beach starts beach starts were so awesome when slalom yeah. had to be set in the waves if there were waves that was awesome compared to watching guys out in the middle of the ocean go back and forth between two or three buoys one kilometer out to sea in terms of growth of the sport uh yeah it's not as fast and technical but it's a lot more fun to watch and to yeah and for the people as well you know like uh, a guy can come interview you straight before the start whatever you know and you're there on the beach you can high five the people whatever yeah i'm all for it yeah it, it makes it better and it it makes it so the biggest heaviest guy is not always going to win if, if you mix it up so it's not you know half a yeah. kilometer between each buoy where you're just standing on going straight make a jive stand on go straight but there's some some board skill and some maneuvers and stuff involved i, I think it would be awesome yeah. i loved that type of racing compared to boat speed pure technical racing yeah one spot you'd have to sail every single day for the rest of your life uh nowhere i'd get bored i like to mix it up Hmm. worst excess baggage bill or check-in story uh fuck i have so many i have so many i you know we used to travel with two course boards two mast bags one piece masts two boom bags two slalom board bags two wave board bags no caddy um you know twelve hundred dollars was average like back in the 80s when that was really a lot my my excess baggage was usually more than double my my ticket it's probably the case now it's a lot harder to fly now nightmares i had sail bags going to canary islands never show up uh i had a triple slalom bag arrive in peros greece opened it up and they had run over all of the boards obviously upside down and broken them all in half brand new never even ridden luckily we had no wins not one race got held so it didn't really matter but yeah i've had a lot of a lot of travel baggage stories yeah who was your worst competitor worst competitor yeah like guy in your heat and you're like fuck not this guy not again um well i had to be bjorn there for for a while like 87 88 89 when you know we were still battling and that was right on the transition from raked fins to vertical fins where i was a little slow catching on and god he was he was so fast it was before he turned into a giant he was just tall but he was he was already fast um otherwise in waves never really had anybody like that um yeah probably probably only bjorn in the heyday you get one million cash and you need to spend it within 24 hours 
What do you buy? Can I put it into stock? I guess, yeah. Or do I have to buy it? It's a pretty physical? boring, it's a pretty like reasonable, boring answer, you know? Yeah, but V twelve, you know, come on, at least you know, something. No, uh, right now because of taxes and everything, I would probably give half a million to charity and I'd buy a new engine for my Volkswagen bus. I'd probably put a new engine in my Studebaker. Uh, and then I'd bunch of, buy a bunch of mature trees and, and I'd buy one of those lawns that you can roll out done for the house I'm building right now because right now all I have is dirt, not one bush, not one tree, not one grass. So. I give a half million to charity. I buy a couple of engines and then I put the rest into trees and bushes and fruit trees and grass. So hell of a garden, 200 yeah. grand in, in, in trees. Yeah. Well, you, you can spend it these days. I swear. Yeah. Okay. If you have a long drive and you listen to a windsurf podcast, who would be on that, on that podcast? You know, I've never actually listened to any podcast ever. Everyone tells me I should. So I guess I would say who would well, be. Well, your longest drive is about 15 minutes. So yeah, 15 minutes. Have to be a short podcast. So someone really entertaining. Uh, Hoyle Schweitzer. The inventor, the grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. He's. I haven't talked to him in a long time. He's still around. He's around 80, early 80s. That'd be interesting. Shit, that's a good idea. Yeah, you should see if you could do that. Because he, he was a really neat guy. He absolutely was the father of this sport, regardless of the whole who invented it thing. He's what made it happen, him and his family. And uh, we owe him a lot. And he's not going to be around a whole lot longer, you know, because he's – not the youngest guy in the world. My dad would be a pretty interesting co podcast. He's so freaking smart. Um, so old guys. And then, I don't know, some really young, passionate windsurfer that, like, has been raised in this universe of internet. You know, some, like, there's a kid here named Koa, the, the son of um, Anna, what was her last name before when she was a sponsored windsurfer? I know. The Dutch girl, Anne Marie. No, no, no. not Anne Marie. Um, she, a uh, French. She was the the girlfriend of um, what the heck's her last name? Anyway, a really young little kid windsurfer would be classic, just to see their perspective on stuff, having none of the history in their 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 mind that that we have. Just windsurfing today pure and unadulterated that comes from the internet and whatever they've seen would be would be classic That's and see what idea. words they use too what what, a, what an eight or ten or 12 year old uses to describe things would be pretty classic too so total opposites like the beginning of the Fake. sport and then the the latest newest you know like bjorn dunkerbeck's kid but younger you know yeah one That's of those kids at Pozo that just wakes up every morning and goes there's wind in the trees like i used to do you'd wake up and go what's the wind doing what's the wind doing you just it's all you can think about. Yeah. And that feeling never really goes away. I mean, I don't know. I, I look at you and I'm like stoked. I'm like, shit, that's what I'm going to feel like in 30 years? Sick. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't go away. You're, you're still looking to see what the wind is doing. And the problem is now you, you get the internet and you just go and look and see what the wind is doing. And the, the mystery is gone. It was cool when it was real mystery. You didn't know if there were waves. Your, your wind gauge was looking up at the trees and going, I think it's windy. And there was no way to tell. You had to drive to the beach to check it out. There was no surf report. There was no wind report. There was no cam. And that romance is kind of gone with everything right at your, your fingertips. Like, I know what it's like in Fiji right now if I want to know. Is there a swell coming? Is Pozo going to be windy in two days? I could fly there and catch it. You know, that, 
that changes things. You know, Not too bad though. You wouldn't want to drop like 5k on a trip to Fiji and have it. No, flat. but yeah, but it was cool when that's what you had to do. You know, I, I had many trips like that to Fiji, to Indonesia, where, you know, to Tahiti, where you, you don't know what you're going to get. And that kind of was cool. You know, sometimes having all the information is not necessarily to your benefit. Mm. You know, yeah. Just to change things. Definitely. Robbie, thank you so much for your time. I yeah. mean, we could thank probably you. do another one of these right off the bat because we barely scraped the surface. But yeah, I won't, I won't hold you hold you any longer oh good yeah. i know it's getting late for you no yeah, it's all right me. it's all right you're you're about yeah you're probably about to go do something it's about the time that winds the beach is open winds 11 o'clock <laughs> yeah. yeah we're free to go so yeah sick yeah appreciate your time thank you so much and um what else can i say just thank you for everything yeah, you've done absolutely. for the sport and 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 for this little for this little brick in the wall as well thank you yeah thank you i i appreciate you reaching out stoked to be part of it and i wish you well i'll see you here whenever they allow us to start moving around yeah. again so you will see you on the water somewhere thank you yeah absolutely take it easy thank thanks you. everybody Bye. okay see ya Yes, there you go, Robbie Nash, still on the water every day at 57 and going strong and going strong. And maybe he's going to support Windsurfing TV. If you think he should, smash us a like down below. Uh, share the podcast uh, to everyone else. Uh, let us know what you think as well. Let us know who you want to see on the podcast as usual. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the channel, like Robbie Nash might do, you can chip in some beer money. I'll put the link below. Um, and those beers will be well received uh, and put towards making this channel bigger and better in the future. Loads more coming up, uh, so stay tuned. I'll stick other links up above the like buttons below.